Hey, I'm Pep, and this is a Pep Talk. Now today, we're going to talk about rules. Everybody loves rules, but specifically, we're going to talk about how sometimes just mixing up exactly how one rule works can essentially destroy a game. Now sometimes that destruction is slight. You just get people who finish the game and think, oh, I don't really like the way this game works. But other times, it completely derails the game to the point where you get halfway through and wonder, how, how does this work? Are, are, can we even finish this? Now you might be thinking, well, if I just read the rules, I won't have this problem, so it doesn't matter. Next video. But the thing is, that's not the case. Not everyone's perfect. Some people are dyslexic, some people read too quickly, and some people are forgetful. I have been at least one of those things multiple times. So I'm going to start off with some examples of how this has happened to me and other people I play games with. Now, I don't want to sit here and explain the rules of the game for too long, so I'm going to give a quick overview of why this rule was wrong and how it affected the game. Let's start big with Twilight Imperium. Ignore that. Now, Twilight Imperium oh, is a heavy game. I'm really sure I could just get a workout doing this. And so, of course, the rules are long, and it's a later edition of the game, which means because I've played 3rd edition, I feel like I already know the rules. So often, when that happens, you like to take the rulebook and more or skim it to see what the differences are. Which means that if there's a rule from before that you simply forgot, well, you're not going to remember it. Because that's how forgetting works. So one of the first times I sat down to play 4th edition, the rule that I forgot was how turn order works. Now, I know you're laughing at me if you've played this before, but see, we simply used the speaker token as the first player and then continued clockwise around that, which was why having the speaker token mattered, right? Well, if you haven't played the game before, the way it actually works is you have seven or eight, eight, eight different roles, essentially, that you can play during the game. You pull out the little tactics cards or whatever. I am so bad with game mechanic names. Either way, there's numbers on all of those, and those numbers, after you've chosen them, are the turn order for that round. Now in my defense, about three quarters of the way through that game, I remembered and made sure to tell everyone. We continued playing the way that we had been playing, but uh, yeah, needless to say, in the next game, I remembered and made sure to play that rule properly. But that brings up an important point. And that is, if you actually do make it halfway or three quarters of the way through a game and remember a rule that was wrong, well, you kind of should just finish that game with the incorrect rule, right? I mean, at that point, it's pretty much up to the players at the table. Usually we'll all agree to just keep playing as is so that nobody has a, well, I didn't know the rule worked that way thing going on. I mean, you're going to get people like that anyway. Because again, not everyone's memory is perfect. Not everyone pays attention the entire time. So sure, I might have said how a rule works three times, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they heard it or remember it. But how did it affect the game? Well, in essence, it meant that one player would always go after another player unless they took turn order, which is not how the game is supposed to go. It is a very warlike game in which it's very important that you're able to do things before particular opponents. So having the essential same turn order, minus whoever is the speaker, kind of breaks the game a little bit. Anyway, let's move on to another game. So we've talked about turn order, let's talk about how a game ends. So if you've ever played Custom Heroes before, you would know that the ending of the game is a little interesting. You essentially need to get to 10 points, but then after you've hit 10 points, you have to win a round. Normally when you win a round, you get points. So you think, okay, well if I get five points, and I'm at five, that means I'm at ten, and I win! Well, that's not how that worked. And don't worry, that's not the part I mixed up. This was more of a misunderstanding of other game mechanics in relation to that. Because there's a few different effects in the game that can cause you to gain points during a round. Sometimes during a turn, sometimes you gain those points um, right at the end of the round because you used a betting card. In both of those cases, you actually gain those points before you gain the rest of the stuff for the end of the round. And before you check to see whether or not you won. So that means that whenever you do that, 
if you would bring yourself up to 10 or 11 or whatever amount of points before you actually normally would gain points, then you actually won the entire game. We didn't really pick up on that at first. So when people played this, they really had a, this game is stupid. Like no matter what, the, you just bully the first player and they just can't win no matter what, which is wrong anyway. But they essentially thought that you literally had to get to 10 points and then win the next round. But there are little clever ways around it and there's ways to sneak in the points and there's ways to make it so that a lot of people have a chance in the same round. And that is a big part of why I wanted to make this video. For stuff like this, where people will play a game and they'll come out of the game saying something like, you know, this was an awful game, I, I hated this game more than any other game, the rules to this make no sense, etc. But a lot of times they just got something wrong. And the reason that they didn't like it is probably because they didn't actually play it right. For another good example of that, let's take a look at a classic game. That game is really buried underneath my stuff. That game is Monopoly. Now there's a lot of rules of Monopoly that people house rule away, people just get rid of, or people forget, or maybe you never even knew it was a rule. And that's another topic I want to get to, but the point is, people will often talk about how Monopoly will take essentially infinite amounts of time. They're like, oh, a game of Monopoly can last seven or eight hours. But it's not usually that they say they can, they say that it will. They've never played a game of Monopoly that was shorter than five hours. I, on the other hand, on average, play a game of Monopoly in uh, an hour and a half to two hours. It is still a longer game. But there's a lot of reasons why people have this trouble with Monopoly. One is that everyone is just nice to each other, so you give people a lot of opportunities to trade and get things that they normally shouldn't have access to. Whereas if you're a little more ruthless, you don't give people things that make it so that they can prolong the game. But that's just strategy. Let's talk rules. One of the most common things is free parking. Maybe you put $500 in the middle. Okay, that's not in the rules, that's made up, but I can understand why you have that. A lot of people have that. Maybe on top of that, you put any tax that the board would normally take into the middle as well. Okay, so there's some extra money that somebody's gonna get every once in a while. But I've seen people take it to another extreme where you put $500 in the middle every time a certain player passes go. Maybe it's the first player and then you just keep track of that player every time they do. Either way, that adds up a lot. Now, if you play under any of those house rules, you're unnecessarily adding money into the game, meaning that people have more chance to pay things off and more chance to buy things that will make it so that they can earn money and stay in the game longer. But that's not all. People also just ignore the auction rule. There is a rule that if you land on a property, you either have to A, buy it, or B, put it up for auction. Some people will just not buy it and say, okay, you go ahead, next player. That's not how it works. If you don't want it, you still have to auction it. If you can't afford it, you still have to auction it. And that's important because that means that all the property are going to get bought up fairly fast. Because let's say player A and B have $10 to their name and player C has, I don't know, 200. Well, if you land on a property that should normally cost 300, player C is likely gonna get it for like 30. Now this game is just an ultimate example of, of where house rules can apply to game because everyone pretty much plays with house rules for this. But that can make it a little bit aggravating when people complain about the game and then you ask them what rules they play with and they play with all these house rules. So it seems strange to me to complain about a game when you're knowingly making the game different or making the game take longer. But that's the extra point I wanted to get to. And that is that not everyone does it knowingly. When you're taught a game, a lot of times people will never look at the rule book again because Maybe they have a pretty good memory, maybe they have a perfect memory, but when they're taught the game, if they're taught the game incorrectly, then when they go to teach it to more people, oops, they're teaching it wrong, and they're playing it wrong, and maybe they don't know that. I have had a lot of examples where I've sat down to play Monopoly and, you know, corrected people on the rules as they came up, and they were baffled. Like, not, oh, you know, these are just house rules we play under. They're, they were baffled that those were the actual rules of the game. They had no idea. 
And that's why I think it's important if you're ever in the middle of a game and something doesn't sound right. You know, maybe a mechanic just sounds too good or not good enough or something like that. I don't usually suggest derailing the game and telling everyone to stop while you try to figure this out, but I think subtly it's a good idea to, to take your phone, maybe check on BGG, Google that specific question and see, you know, if this has come up before, maybe you can find a solution. Maybe just grab the rule book and kind of peruse really quickly. Say you just want to check on something. The less you can interrupt the game while you do it, the better. Um, so I don't suggest waiting until it's your turn and then sitting there looking up how you want to do your turn. I suggest waiting for someone else's turn. But either way, it's a good idea that if something feels wrong or makes you uncomfortable about the game, then you look it up. Because sometimes, as I said, people are just wrong. They might have been taught wrong, they might have missed a word or two, and it can make a big difference. So if you happen to catch it early enough that it hasn't affected the game at all, you might save a game ahead of time. And this is also a good reason not to necessarily let one person be in control of learning and teaching the rules. It's usually a good idea to have at least two people, but preferably everybody to have read the rules ahead of time. And this isn't necessarily to beat up on that one player and say, oh, they're bad at learning the rules, so everyone should do it. It's more a mutual respect thing. If you all know the rules, somebody will still go over them, but that way, you know, multiple people have learned it. So if one person missed something and this other person missed something and this third person missed something, Likely those aren't the same things that you've missed and you'll be able to correct each other and make sure that the game runs smoothly. Because one downside to having one person learn and teach the game is something like in a Legacy game. So Risk Legacy was, I suppose, the first Legacy game I've played. I am fairly confident it was the first Legacy game, but could be wrong. Either way, I was essentially in charge of learning the rules and teaching it to the players. And anytime there was a rule question, I was the one who went and looked it up and tried to correct things for people. But see, at the same time, I was the one who was winning each scenario. I believe we got through eight scenarios, and out of the eight, I had won five of them. Now, if you've played Legacy games before, you probably know that winning scenarios will often give you perks. And in a game where you're being competitive against other players, those perks can really add up. So in this example, about every second game, we would find a rule that was done wrong for the last two games, and then we would correct it. And then we would play another game, or maybe two other games, and then find another rule that was wrong and correct it. Now, it's been a long time, so I don't remember what rules were wrong, but what I do remember is what it did to the game. Because at least one of the other players, possibly two, we're not happy about this. It essentially came down to the only reason you won was because of the way we were playing the rules. And they were right, so I didn't feel good about it either. But you know, there's always the defense that, well, everyone's playing the rules the same way, so it doesn't really matter. But some strategies just clearly are not valid if you're playing the rules correctly. So if you happen to be someone who notices this indiscrepancy, indiscrepancy, discrepancy, and takes advantage of it, maybe not even, you know, on purpose. Well, if other people don't, then yeah, of course you're gonna win. You're taking advantage of something that isn't even a rule. So that's just another reason to be careful, because the game stopped. We never finished this. This is still a half-finished game of Risk Legacy, because at least one of the players just full-on quit. They didn't want to play anymore because they felt like the whole game was messed up. It would make more sense to restart after all that. And they're kind of not wrong. So, yeah. Now I talked earlier about how sometimes not reading the rules correctly can end the game about halfway through with people just being like, how do we actually finish this? And a good example of this is Cryptid. Cryptid is a game where you're hunting cryptids like Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster. And when we played it for the first time, the rules were skimmed rather quickly, and so we were placing cubes a lot more often than you should. Normally the way it works is I'll say, could it be here, and they'll either place a cube or a disc. We were placing cubes no matter what. So even if they placed a disc, we were placing one of our own cubes to say where it couldn't be. Needless to say, 
One player ran out of cubes relatively quickly. It also wasn't made inherently obvious that because you picked one spot, that spot is definitely not where it could be. We, we didn't really interpret it that way. So sometimes people would ask the same spot multiple times too, which means that there would be cubes going on the board that really had no business being there. Either way, we ran out of cubes. So quickly, we had to check the rules and say, well, are these a limited resource? If you run out, then, then can we just find more cubes somewhere? Now, I don't remember if it was a limited resource or not, but they shouldn't run out. So whether we found the rule or not, we eventually found the other rule saying how things really worked and that you only needed to place a cube if you were wrong, essentially, and that you shouldn't place them onto spots where cubes have already been because the game just doesn't work that way. A no is a no, and a yes is a maybe in that case. And so with better reading of the rules, that game could have went from stalling halfway through to just completing the first time. It also gave people the impression that flat out guessing where it was was the best strategy, which made you run out of your circles much faster than you normally would. And so our first few games were a little bit messed up, which is a shame because I think it's a great game. And we kind of had a moment where we thought, this game is awful, this makes no sense. But we were wrong. This also happened to us when we were playing Tribe Second Edition. If you've never played this before, it's like a dexterity game where you're placing items onto people and you roll a die that tells you what color you need to place or what type of item, etc. But either way, you get points for making tribes, which are groups of three or five with the same color or shape. So when we played this, the problem was it was very easy to manipulate other people. You essentially either wanted to A, be the person who puts the three or five and gets the points, or B, avoid putting the second or fourth because that would give the next player the opportunity to get the points. And people complained about that. They said this game isn't really fun, it's just making sure people don't place things on those specific ones. But that's the thing is, you aren't supposed to play it that way. It's supposed to rotate between the little pedestals. So first person is supposed to place on this pedestal, this uh, tribesman um, person, human figure. So the next person would place on the next human figure, which means that while you still have the ability to try to avoid placing where you should or shouldn't, or what you should or shouldn't in order to have someone who goes next get the points, the thing is, because you're forced to place on a certain human figure, it doesn't really work that way anyway, and it might still turn out a little more random than it should, but either way, it at very least does not work the way that we played it. Now maybe you've gotten this far in, and you're somewhere between confused or angry at me, like, how could you have missed all these particular rules? Well, the thing is, it wasn't always me learning the rules in these cases, sometimes it was other people, but that's no offense. I just miss things. If it's a later edition of a game, Often, as I said with Twilight Imperium, you know the rules, so really you're just trying to find what the rule differences are. It feels really strange to read like a 30 page rule book when maybe two pages of it have new information, but it's spread across the whole thing. It feels like a lot of extra reading for something that you already know. And people forget things. And sometimes people forget things, but are very confident that they haven't. I, myself, have done it, and I've seen a lot of other people do it many times, where they simply say, no, that's not how the rule works, it works this way. But then you go and look, and they were just wrong. Maybe they're remembering an older edition. Maybe they just never learned the rule properly. Maybe they were taught the rule wrong. But at the end of the day, people make mistakes. People don't notice things. And in the rule books, sometimes, in my opinion, it's their fault. If there's a very critical rule, and that rule hinges on literally one word in one sentence within 30 pages of a rule book, well, of course people are gonna miss that at some point. That's why even though often I'll complain if a rule book really likes to repeat the same rules over and over because they're kind of wasting our time, at the same time, it's hammering in that is how this works. It's also a good reason for examples because then if you happen to also read the example, you'll read it and think, wait, that's not what that just said. And then you'll go back and read the real rule again and be like, oh, that is what it said, I just messed up. So the moral of the story is just be careful when reading the rule book. If something, again, sounds wrong, maybe go back and read it again. Maybe read the whole rule book twice. 
Maybe make it so that at least two people in your game group are responsible for learning a game so they can kind of teach it together. Any of those solutions tends to solve that problem. I have a few more examples, so I'm just gonna keep going through them. If you ever played Hocus before, it's basically poker, but some cards have effects and you do things a little differently. You kind of take actions that represent things that you do in poker. This one's hard to explain. Either way, whenever you get the prize, which is paid out in cards essentially that are worth points, some of the prizes are owls, and those owls have a special effect. Now, when we played for the first time, one of us, I believe me, misread the owl part, which basically said, on your turn, you can use an owl, like you do your regular turn, and then you use an owl to get its effect. Now, I believe what I read was the fact that it said you can, or like you then return the owl, but I just interpreted this as like putting the owl back like into your hand or back like into your point area so you could use it again. And of course, this meant that the first person to get owls had an extreme advantage in future rounds where every time they did a turn, they could pick one of their owls and use them and just keep repeating those over and over. And so that first game was just destroyed. It, it bore no resemblance to the way the game actually should work. And then later when we found out how it really worked and that the owls go back to the bottom of the deck immediately after being used, it made a lot of sense. Heck, if you don't use an owl during that round, it also gets returned back to the bottom of the deck. So we really messed that one up. Another, of course, big offender of this kind of thing is if you're playing role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons, because although the dungeon master does quote-unquote make the rules, sometimes you just mess something up. Again, these things usually go through different printings of editions, so maybe you're remembering a rule from a previous edition, maybe you just misheard or misremembered something and you're doing it wrong in general. Either way, it can make a big difference. And if it's the kind of difference that ends up killing a party, well, when someone finds out the next day or the next week that that's not how a rule worked and they died because of it, they might not be too happy. So my big solution in this kind of thing, rather than learning exactly how every rule works, because unlike a normal rule book, this is 300 pages, and this is just the player handbook, not the Dungeon Master Guide, well, maybe you just need to be willing to retcon things. So in that case where everyone died and shouldn't have, you simply go back to that session and redo it. Heck, maybe you have the gods kind of rewind time a little bit and give everyone a second chance. So that's why they actually remember what happened in the combat because they just wake up again at the start of the combat and are like, didn't we just die? They did, but they've been given the second chance to defeat this enemy. All right, I've only got one last one here and that is modern art. So. That was loud. This one was broken for a reason that I really don't enjoy. And that reason is math. So the point of this game is that you are bidding on art. You all have the art, but you're essentially putting it up for auction in order to either buy it back yourself and throw your money to the bank or pay the money to, or have other players pay you in order to take the paintings. Now the prices of this art are determined by, at the end of the round, whichever art had the most involvement. So if a particular artist had five paintings, which is the number that triggers the end of a round, then that artist's paintings are gonna be worth $30 each. Now, the second most is worth 20, and the third most is worth 10. So in round one, it is easy, and it is a little mathy, because at no point would you ever bid $30 or more for a painting because then you're just not gaining money and or straight up losing money. But this is where the game got mathy. Because in a future round, the prices from the previous round are kept. And then on top of that, you add more. So let's say in a future round, the same artist were to end up in first, they would gain another 30. So now their paintings are worth 60. And the second would gain 20, 10. But there are five artists, so the same artist likely won't win each round, especially because you don't shuffle the deck, you just keep going through it. And there's a, kind of an equal amount of each artist, I assume. And that means that you're gonna eventually run out of the red artist paintings. Now here's the part that we got wrong. See, 
Let's pretend that artist that won in the first round that had the most and got 30 actually didn't get any, the 30, 20, or 10 this round. Well, by the actual rules, what's supposed to happen is their paintings are worth nothing. No one had interest in their art this round. Whereas if they had have gotten any number, even the 10, their total from all previous rounds would add up. So that would be worth 40. Now how we played it was that all the rounds added up always. So even though they didn't have any value to their painting this round, they still get to sell for at least 30. Now what this did was make the game completely math-based. Every time something went up for auction, you could go, okay, well, no matter what, it's least worth at least this minimum. So there was no starting at one and slowly bidding your way up. There was like, oh, that's worth at least 30. Okay, 25 opening bid. Okay, so it, it kind of took away the bidding aspect and instead people knew pretty much exact values and started to bid at exactly what they would be willing to pay. Whereas in a, the case of how the rule is actually supposed to work, if you were to bid 25 on that artist and then they didn't end up in the first, second, or third position, well, you lost $25 because their painting's worth nothing. So it's supposed to be a game of risk and high reward for making bold decisions, but it ended up being just a math fest. And at the end, everyone was like, I hate this game. I had literally people say, I hate this game. It's just math. There's like, the bidding is nonsensical because there's really no reason to bid higher than a certain number. And they were essentially right. But they were also wrong, because that's not how the game worked. So, too long, didn't read. I guess you don't usually, you usually abbreviate that TLDR, because too long, didn't read is too long. Long story short, read the rule book, pay attention, because sometimes one tiny mistake can completely ruin a game. And I feel for the publishers who get bad reviews on games, because imagine if people weren't reasonable and after that game they went and reviewed the game and said like two like i give this game two out of ten this is a horrible game it's nonsense mechanics it's all about math and like there's basically no game behind this at all and they would just be wrong they're giving it a bad review because they literally didn't understand it so yeah don't do that be more careful and uh that's been my pep talk thanks for watching if you have any questions about anything you saw, or if you have any other situations that you had with games where missing one rule completely destroyed the game, I would love to hear about those in the comments below. But until next time, live free, game hard.